Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're making that big old feast that Carl Casper prepares for himself to prove that he can still cook. And look, here's his actual carving fork that John Favreau was kind enough to give to me. And here's my carving fork, because today, a whole bunch of brand new Babish cookware items are now available on Amazon, including this carving fork, a cast iron trivet, stainless steel saute pan, and carbon steel wok, with lots more to come in the next few months, including this 12-piece essential cookware set. Anyway, let's put these tools to good use as we make a whole lot of food, starting with a marinade for some pork belly. I've got the juice of one orange and two limes here that I'm gonna combine with two Two tablespoons of mirin, two tablespoons of soy sauce, two tablespoons kosher salt, one tablespoon of whole black peppercorns, one tablespoon of Mexican oregano, three bay leaves, also in a tiny cup for some reason, two Mexican cinnamon sticks, likewise tiny cup, and five cloves of garlic lightly crushed. This is going to help us fish it out of the marinade later on. Now we're also going to incorporate one whole dried ancho chili, stem and seeds removed, which we're going to dry roast in a pan for five minutes before dousing with water and letting soak for ten more minutes, adding a couple ice cubes if the peppers are still steaming hot off the stove. Once you have achieved a nice smooth pepper puree and it's not too warm, we're going to add it to our marinade, which we're now going to put to good use with some pork belly, the likes of which Chef Casper could be seen plating up with a whole bunch of pretty sauces. Sometimes a big old hunk of belly like this one comes with the ribs still intact, so we're going to have to take those off. Hang on to these if you want to add porky flavor to something. And we're also going to remove the skin, which you can also hang on to if you want to make cracklin. Then I'm subdividing the belly into two more manageable pieces, placing them in a zip top bag and pouring our marinade over the top, massaging gently but thoroughly to evenly destroy distribute and then fridging for 24 hours, during which time we're going to tend to those pretty sauces I was talking about. First up, a roasted garlic carrot puree. We're taking a whole head of garlic, decapitating it, drizzling with olive oil and wrapping in aluminum foil and roasting for about 45 minutes at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we're grabbing a pound of carrots, peeling, chopping into more manageable pieces, a little over dramatically if you ask me. Then we are whacking them into a high walled saucepan, covering with water about two cups worth, bringing to a simmer and letting it cook for 15-20 minutes until completely tender and easily pierceable with your piercing implement of choice. Now it's time to blend, so we're going to dump these carrots in most of their cooking liquid, our cloves of roasted garlic, half teaspoon of freshly toasted and ground cumin, one tablespoon of brown sugar, and the juice of half a lemon in our favorite high-powered blender, blending on maximum velocity for two or three minutes or until completely smooth. I'm also emulsifying a little olive oil in there while the blender runs, which turned out to be a mistake. It lightened up the color too much, I think, but I added some more steamed carrots, and I think we evened it out. Go ahead and chill this until it's time to serve. Next up, Roy Choi described the green sauce as a salsa verde. So I got a pound of tomatillos here that I've peeled, cut in half, and drizzled with oil along with two serrano peppers and half a small onion. This guy's headed under the broiler for two to five minutes until nicely charred. Then, as was with the carrots, so go with the tomatillos. We're going to place these in the blender along with some other salsa verde essentials. Four cloves of garlic, a generous bunch of cilantro if that's your thing. I'm not going to judge you. Totally understand if you want to judge me though. The juice of one lime by hand or by machine if you just check the dishwasher. A generous pinch of salt and that's about it. Cover it up and blend it down. Normally we'd want to go for a pretty chunky consistency, but the sauce seen in the movie is perfectly smooth. So once that consistency is achieved, we're going to pour it out, let it cool, cover it up, and fridge it until ready to use. Another thing we can make ahead of time is this chili garlic sauce that the pork is finished with. We've got a third of a cup of gochujang, a quarter cup of soy sauce, a quarter cup of honey, three tablespoons of brown sugar, four crushed cloves of garlic, and one tablespoon of freshly grated ginger. Give this a tiny whisk until homogenous and set it aside until ready to use, or eat it all with a spoon because it's really, really delicious. Last up in our day before mise en place are some quick pickled radishes, one of my favorite snacks. We're slicing half a dozen radishes nice and thin, adding a tablespoon of mustard seeds and an optional quarter teaspoon of red chili flakes, and then we're preparing our quick pickling liquid. Half a cup each, water and white vinegar, and a quarter cup of sugar. Bring to a simmer with tiny whisk until dissolved, and pour over the radishes, covering and letting cool completely. Then, finally, we gotta get our pork started. I know that Chef Casper just ran home and made this in one night, but being a chef, I figure he's got some of this stuff kicking around. I'm removing the pork from the marinade, rinsing and patting dry, and then placing in vacuum sealed bags for sous vide. 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 hours should do the trick, after which these guys can be immediately removed from the sous vide and plunged into an ice bath, and then held in the fridge until we're ready to throw in the oven and serve. So now we're getting into our day of dinner stuff, and the first thing I want to knock out is the caramel dust that he pours over the fruit. I got one cup of granulated sugar that I'm going to combine with one tablespoon of light corn syrup in a large, wide, heavy bottom stainless steel sauce. Been, placing over medium, medium low heat and stirring infrequently until it forms a deep golden amber caramel. Then we're going to pour that out onto a super non stick, super heat proof surface like a silpat set in a rimmed baking sheet. 
Try to get it spread out as evenly and as thinly as possible, maybe inadvisably using a rubber spatula to perpetuate that idea and failing, then letting it cool completely at room temperature until ready to smash, making sure to keep it away from moisture. In the meantime, we can get our berries macerating. I got a pint each, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. I'm sprinkling those with a quarter cup of sugar and some finely chopped fresh mint, which I'm going to bunch into an adorable little bundle for easier slicing. Sprinkle this over top and give this guy a good mix and allow it to macerate in the fridge for a few hours. It's gonna draw out all the juices. Next up, to my dismay, Chef Carl Casper uses his big, beefy, Rocky Marciano-like forearms to beat whipped cream by hand. So for the sake of accuracy and solidarity, I will begrudgingly do the same, but I'm not gonna not be a wimp about it. I promise that five minutes spent painfully hand-whipping whipped cream are more valuable than a $10 hand mixer. That being said, go ahead and whip this to firm peaks and keep it fridged until you're ready to use it. Next up, the steak was accompanied by some butter-roasted fingerling potatoes. So I'm chopping up a pound's worth into bite-sized pieces and placing them in some cold, heavily salted water spiked with a tablespoon of white vinegar, bringing to a simmer and cooking for about 12 minutes until completely tender, then spreading out on a rimmed baking sheet to cool until we're ready to roast. Next up, there's a whole bunch of food accessories surrounding the dry-aged ribeye, so we're going to knock those out. First up, some ribbons of zucchini that are grilled and seasoned with lemon verbena. So for consistency's sake, and because I don't trust my knife skills, I'm slicing these into ribbons via mandolin, drizzling with oil, seasoning with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper, then taking them out to the grill, where I'm going to grill them over high heat for about one minute per side, along with some corn, likewise drizzled with oil and grilled for about five minutes all told. I know I don't have any footage from the grill, but it was raining and nighttime and you're just gonna have to trust me. We're gonna chop this stuff off the cob to make a super simple lime corn salad. A little squirt of olive oil, a little sprinkle of kosher salt, and a little squeeze of lime. And that's all there is to it. Is it because it's just a side dish and I don't want to overcomplicate it? Hell yes it is. Can simple things still be really, really tasty? Hell yes they can be. Speaking of which, we have our lovely ribbons of grilled zucchini, which I'm gonna to top with lemon verbena, which again, Against all odds, I actually have growing in my backyard, which I'd forgotten about until after Kendall and I had searched for grocery stores for it. We're finally chopping this up, sprinkling it over top, and that's all there is to it. Moving on to another little bit of mise en place, a stir-fry sauce for our octopus. In and bowl, we're combining one and a half tablespoons of soy sauce, one teaspoon of sesame oil, one tablespoon sugar, one tablespoon gochugaru, two tablespoons gochujang, three cloves of crushed garlic, and an inch or two of grated fresh ginger. Go ahead and tiny whisk this together until it's samajas and set aside until blah blah blah. blah. Next up, we have some Meyer Lemon Creme Fresh. Couldn't find a Meyer Lemon, so I'm just zesting a regular lemon and some Creme Fresh. If this ruins the entire meal, you will be the first to know. And now with all of our accoutrement out of the way, we can get down to the business of steak. A big old dry-aged bone-in ribeye that we're gonna generously salt and pepper on all facades and let sit at room temperature for at least half an hour. Just kidding, I guess we're still working on side dishes. Since the potatoes are described as butter roasted, I'm tossing them together with kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper, and clarified butter, which won't burn like regular butter in the punishing heat of a 450 degree Fahrenheit oven. When we mix these together to coat, we really want to beat them up so they get coated in a thick, gooey layer of starch, which is going to help them get extra crispy in the oven. Lastly, I'm pouring them onto a preheated baking sheet, making sure that they're as flat as possible, which is going to help maximize browning and prevent stickage. Next up, we have some simple sumac roasted cauliflower. So we're going to dissect a head of cauliflower, 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 Toss them together with some light olive oil, kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper, and sumac, a bright lemony spice that I think is criminally underutilized, and which grew on trees in my backyard growing up. I think. That might have been one of those childhood memories I invented. Anyway, these guys are headed onto a rim baking sheet and into a 450 degree Fahrenheit oven, getting tossed halfway through their 15 to 20 minute roast. While those are roasting, we're retrieving our pork belly from the fridge, wiping off any excess pork goo, placing them on a rack set in a rimmed baking sheet, and popping into a 400 degree Fahrenheit convection oven until crisped on the outside and warmed through. Now we're popping our salted and rested ribeye into a ripping hot cast iron pan, searing beautifully on one side and proceeding to butter baste, popping a big old knob of butter into the pan along with some thyme and garlic, and repeatedly basting the steak in bubbling butter, one of the few remaining joyous activities in life. Then we're popping this onto a rack set in a rim baking sheet, I gotta stop using the word popping, and finishing the and finishing the steak off in the oven whilst we parboil our octopus. I got two small octopi here that I'm going to poach for one minute until they turn the boiling water into an enchanting hue of red, fishing out with a slotted spoon or spider, and transferring to a cutting board for a dissection. These octopi have already had their beaks and intestines removed, and as delicious 
delicious as they are, I definitely should not have watched my octopus teacher last night. That was a huge mistake. At least they can be generously salted with my tears. Once they've been broken down into less recognizable and emotionally jarring pieces, we're ready to stir fry. Heat up a couple tablespoons of oil in a ripping hot wok. Add one handful each sliced onions and green cabbage. Fry those up for about three minutes until they're starting to wilt and take on some color. Add one small chopped up bird's eye chili and a couple batons of scallions and give those about one minute of heat before adding the octopus, giving that about a minute of heat and then adding our stir fry sauce. Likewise, stir frying for one to two more minutes to heat through and caramelize the sugars. Finish with some sesame seeds, a little drizzle of sesame oil, taste for seasoning, and you're ready to rock. Speaking of caramelizing sugars, we're brushing down our pork belly with our garlic chili sauce before placing back in the oven under the broiler to crisp up. And now, finally, mercifully, we're ready to serve. To do so, we're going to arrange all the side dishes on a large cutting board next to the steak, including the roasted vegetables, but also some sun-dried tomatoes, salmon roe, and bowls of fresh herbs. Smear our carrot puree onto a serving plate, smash up our caramel and sift it to make caramel dust, load up the berries with whipped cream and top with said caramel dust, retrieve the pork belly from the oven and let it rest for a minute or two before carving it into big old chunks, top it with salsa verde, pickled radishes, and slice up the steak. And there you have it, John Favreau's character's f**k you meal to Dustin Hoffman's character. The steak is delicious because it's a butter-based and dry-aged ribeye, so duh. The potatoes are fluffy on the inside and super crispy on the outside. Highly recommend. The zucchini is okay. I'm not a huge fan of lemon verbena, but the sumac cauliflower is delicious. I love the bright, fresh sides that go with the steak. The pork belly, however, is the real winner here. It is juicy, spicy, and flavorful, and is in and of itself a reason to buy a sous vide. And the octopus is nice and tender and lovely and spicy. And that's it, folks. I've had my first bite, so it's time to let the cast and crew of Binging with Babish dig in.